Hi, my name is Elizabeth Laufer, and I am a German to English literary translator uh, based in New York State uh, in the US. And I am so pleased to be here today to talk with Pierre Jaravan, the author of Ein Lied für die Vermissten, which in English has been translated as Song for the Missing. Pierre has his printed copy. I have not yet received my, my uh, copies of, of this fabulous novel that I had the honor of translating. Um, as I say, I do, I do works from, from German to English. I've translated a, num a number of books, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, children's book, picture books. Um, and it's really, it's really a, a profession that I absolutely love and has not been too upended by the pandemic, fortunately. And I'm so pleased to be part of the Tennessee Williams Festival here with Pierre, as I mentioned, and I will now introduce him. Pierre Jarvan was born in 1985 in Amman, Jordan, to a Lebanese father and a German mother, and moved to Germany with his family at the age of three. He has won international prizes as a slam poet, and in 2016 was named Literature Star of the Year by the daily newspaper Abendzeitung. Jarvan received numerous awards for his debut, The Storyteller, which went on to become an international bestseller. So far translated into six languages, it is a bookseller's favorite in Germany, the Netherlands, France, and Brazil. Song for the Missing is his second novel. And that is the novel that we will be discussing today. Thank you, Liz. So take it away, Pierre. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here with you to have the conversation. Um, as you said, you translated the book and it's a, it's a great, um, great translation. And do you want me to start reading before we do anything else or should we talk about, about anything before that? I think, I think let's start with a reading and, and let that set the stage. Okay, so I'll uh, read from the very beginning, the, the, the very first sentences and pages of the book. It's the, yeah, the introduction and the book. Um, it starts with Persian uh, words and those words are Yeki Bud, Yeki Nabud. The best. The oldest stories in the world have always begun the same way. Once upon a time, or rather, there once was and there once wasn't. From a trove of Persian phrases, this one is the foundation, the driving force behind all storytelling, the opening of every fairy tale. Someone was there and someone wasn't there. There once was a time and there once was no time. Yeki bud, yeki nabud. Close your eyes and think of Beirut because there once was a city just as the elderly describe it, and there wasn't. Beirut back then, they remember it well. Beirut before the war, Habibi Yaini. Beirut meant sunshine, freedom, joie de vivre. Summer nights at Pepe Abed Seaside Tavern, where they served the most beautiful lobster and moored yachts rocked on the waves. The Saint-Tropez of the Levant, all year round, the warm scent of food rose from family picnics along the beach. Metze bought at Nabunaim on Rue de Rafour with date-filled cookies for the little ones to enjoy on the rocky coastline. Shadows on the Azure Sea, Middle East Airlines flights descending, carrying a steady stream of tourists to the Paris of the Middle East. The light of dawn over the mountains flooding the city with color. That was the old Beirut or the dim glow of jazz clubs and bars at night, where the spotlights glinted off Jamila Omar's jewelry as she sang and belly danced. Not a stone throw down the boardwalk was the venerable St. George Hotel, where heavy carpets dampened the sound of rumors, its pile full of secrets whispered between spies at the bar, shaded figures on the chessboard of the city. Beirut, was stray dogs roving the streets, and sometimes Maurice, the young waiter at Mar Elias, would feed them marinated chicken livers he had sneaked from the kitchen. Because Beirut meant abundance, it, meant, it meant brotherly love and consideration, 
when half the city funneled into the mosques for Friday prayers and later re-emerged to the sound of church bells from the east, summoning Christians to evening services. Beirut before the war meant sound, city of song and melody. People sang on the street, muezzins sang from minarets, nuns sang with the congregation in church. The din of money changers clamoring in Place de Martyrs, lovers laughing on the corniche, vendors haggling at the souk around the Place de l'Etoile clock tower, and Ahmed Aziz, the shoe shiner outside the Moonlight Hotel, murmuring a have a nice day to Marlon Brando and Brigitte Bardot. In the shimmering city of contradictions, the Armenian jeweler played checkers with a Maronite tailor and she eat fruit seller, while in a cafe outside the bazaar, you'd share a hookah and inquire after the health of the family, but never mention religion. Because holidays were celebrated together and a city home to many religions celebrates many holidays. Beirut was Tikra Nakharian, the lutenist who sang his songs beneath the lancet windows on Rue Monod, ballads that made women blush in their rooms. And Beirut was Hussein Badir, the souvenir salesman on Rue Hamra, always grumbling about declining very beat sales, worried that people weren't sufficiently worried. There is storytelling and there is silence and the questions in between. What about the mistrust, the fears, the doubts? How could what came later have happened and why? You are met with silence in the very places you should find answers, sand and desert. Geography books teach us that Lebanon is the only Arab country without a desert, but that isn't true. The desert is everywhere and within it, there is no language for remembrance, no language for memory. The silence you are asking about is more profound than stillness because stillness never really consumes everything. A clock's ticking or refrigerator's hum remains, even the smallest space. Add to that the muted rumble of everyday life outside the window, quiet, hush, stillness. There are plenty of wrong words you could choose. Silence is different. It engulfs the horizon and devours all it touches. And whatever sense of certainty you had hoped to discover steals away like a gloved cat burglar. Even in the olden days, storytellers in the cafes and public squares in Isfahan, Cairo, Damascus and Beirut knew there was more to the desert than mere emptiness. Beneath the sand were entire cities civilizations that at some point had sunk. A single grain of sand, one of the old masters told me when I was still a child, we had gotten caught in a storm and spent the night at a stranger's house. That's all it takes to set a great story in motion. So that's how it starts. That's how it starts. And that for me, of course, as initially a reader and then as the translator was the first encounter I had with this text and the first bit of text that I was working with that was so evocative, so lyrical and really drew me in, drew me in entirely as I, as I started working with the text. But I'm curious in your writing process, when you actually wrote this prologue, was it the first thing you wrote? Was it something that emerged later after the story had already developed? Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question because when, when I wrote my first novel, The Storyteller, um, it took me only eight months to write the book and it, it's about the same length. It has both around 450 pages and um, when I started the second book, um, I thought, okay, writing a novel takes about eight months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started writing and I realized that, um, that I, I was wrong <laughs> and um, that the, writing the first book, that it might have been an exemption, you know, that uh, it just, it, it, I felt easy writing it. So, but um, the second book was much, much harder 
I think maybe partly because it, the first one had been a success. So I kind of felt pressure. Um, on the other hand, it was also the theme because while the first book has some parallels with my biography, the second book is very much far away from my biography. So I really had to rely on the research on the first hand and then also make up things and put these together. So it was much more complex, but I wrote, it took me four years to write the book and um, I deleted in that process around 300 pages. So, oh. <laughs> so you can say I wrote two books. <laughs> one, I, put, I threw one book away and uh, before I, I, I finished uh, the real one. And uh, to answer your question, um, I, like in the beginning, I, I wrote 400, uh, no, 150 pages. And I even I submitted these pages to get a scholarship, which I which I got. But these pages are not in the book anymore. So uh, yeah. after 150 pages, I realized this is it's I'm on the wrong path. Uh -huh. It's not going to work like this. It works until here, but now I'm stuck and. I, Unfortunately, I can't go back 20 pages or 50 pages to fix it, but I have to go back the whole, whole way and start all over again. I, I didn't have a, a first person narration, I had third person narration, I had different characters. I thought characters were more important than they were, uh -huh. while, while uh, characters that I um, thought of as less important turned out to be more important. So. It was very interesting, and um, when I came across this uh, Persian words, you know, uh, once there was and there once wasn't, I realized that this is not only the first sentence of the book, but th this is the book. Mm. It's about not having certainty. It's about uh, uh, the you are unable to rely on anything, um, yeah. and uh, so, in fact, it's uh, if you take the my second try. This is the beginning I wrote. It's, it's not the first pages I wrote, but it was the real beginning. And it's, okay. it's, it's, it's there from the beginning, yeah. Okay, wow. Were those, were those 150 pages that you deleted, are they permanently deleted? You never wanna think of them again, or have you got them in a back pocket somewhere? Yeah, I, I, of course, that would be stupid just to throw them away. <laughs> I mean, uh, I even took, I even, you know, when I wrote, I, I, I came across some sentences I had written before for the first draft, uh, which I could perfectly use now, uh, and they fit it in. It, it's just the whole, you know, struct, a structure, a question of structure, of wrong structure and wrong character constellation and wrong perspective yeah. uh, on the whole story um, that needed to be uh, yeah, redrawn. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a courageous act. And, but, but, it, but it sounds as though it was quite clear. The decision was clear. Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating, of course. It's, especially if you're not used to it, especially if your first experience uh, on writing books is so, you know, picture perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but I think this is, you know, this is what writing a book really looks like and the first one was the exception. So right. I'm, I'm more relaxed now when it comes to the third book. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm curious, um, <clears throat> the images, the images that you paint of this golden age, Beirut, which as I understand was the 1950s, 1960s, kind of mid-century, um, mid-20th century, do these, or, or how do these images figure into Lebanese identity today? Are they still quite present and, and upheld as some ideal or are they far more distant now? Um, maybe it depends on whom, who you ask, uh, also which generation, of course, but also where they live. Because if you if you would ask maybe the Lebanese diaspora, you know, in, in exile, they would maybe refer to this to this age as the golden age that, that they left behind. And whenever they think of Lebanon, they leave out, you know, the the whole reason why they left. Yeah. But rather focus on what um, came before that, and which is the golden age um, of Lebanon and, and maybe the Middle East. And um, if you ask the younger generation, of course, they they know this they know this as a story, mm -hmm. um, but they are much more caught in the present and all the conflicts and all the trouble 
and all the misery. Uh, so it really depends on yeah whom you ask. Yeah, yeah. And and with that, well, it's for 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 me as well. Encountering encountering this novel, and having essentially the history of Lebanon from the early 20th century through the early 21st century told through the characters and through the story. Um, I mean, for me, certainly I was, I was encountering a history I was not very familiar with. Um, we go through, it's our, our narrator, Amin, is writing in 2011 and it's the Arab Spring. He's reflecting back on his youth, his early teens, uh, which took place in the early 90s in post-war Beirut after having lived in Germany for the first several years of his life with his grandmother when she, she fled the country in the early 80s with him and fled uh, the Civil War. We have the outbreak of the Civil War in 1975, then this golden age. Then we even have insight into the 1920s and 30s. If I've done my math correctly, we see some of his grandmother's youth uh, during the French mandate. Um, so we have we have a really wide uh, a really wide depiction of of the last 100, 150 years or so. Um, and I'm wondering if you could describe some of your research. I mean, you say that your first novel was was different perhaps in that it didn't take as much research. And I'm wondering what the research uh, what research went into writing this one. Mm. Well, I mean, the first one, it took me a lot of research as well, but I, I, like if I just consider the writing process, it was eight months. There was a long period of research before that, but uh, just the writing. And, and here, um, the, just the writing was four years without the research. So uh, that's the difference. I mean, maybe it, we can talk about the title uh, just to, for the audience to explain sure. Song for Missing, which is that's, that's, um, the central theme of the book, The Missing. Yeah. I mean, many people aren't aware that uh, um, we are talking about 17,500 people still missing today in Lebanon, and they are missing um, for 40 years or more. Uh, we know that uh, from many countries, Argentina, for example, is one of the most uh, famous examples uh, um, from you know people who went missing because there there was some kind of you know um, they tried uh, to to get justice uh, in, in court and, and they achieved partly uh, you can say in Lebanon it's it's um, it's a taboo inside the country you know many people many young people aren't even aware that seventeen thousand people are missing in their country and we're talking about a country with maybe five to six million inhabitants only. Mm -hmm. So 17,500 is a big number. Yeah. And that was, um, as this is, you know, in the center of the book, the topic that uh, the whole story is uh, yeah, developing around this topic, the, the, the effect uh, that I needed to know much about the missing, about um, how they went missing, how I was responsible for that, but also even more important, um, how to, um, relatives deal with it and all this and um, that took most of the of, of the research yeah. and and I understand you spent you spent a good deal of time at the is it a national archive in in Beirut um no unfortunately there's uh, and there's no national archive because that would require some kind of government to support uh, <laughs> that uh, and um, that's where the problem starts I mean yeah, the people in the government today are, in part, former militiamen. You know who uh, are directly or indirectly responsible for making people go missing. So they have no uh, interest at all um, about someone talking about this or even in, you know, organizing an archive or something. So it's really um, you have to rely on. Um, civil structures on on people uh, from from the population from the uh, yeah, from Beirut to um, collect evidence or new old newspapers and all this and to make this somehow accessible. 
has your book has your book been released in has, is it available in Lebanon? Um, it's available in um, it's not in, uh, translated to Arabic, um, but they are able to read it in, in French and mm -hmm. now of course in English with this translation. Yeah. But, have yeah. you? No, I have, no, I have no response so far. No uh, response. <laughs> <laughs> no, from the I have from the first book, and I I will be in Beirut. I have been invited by the American University to do a reading in September. So maybe that's when uh, things are going to start. But I mean, right now they have other problems than literature. <laughs> they yeah. they really yeah. yeah. I wonder if you might talk a bit about that about what Lebanon looks like today. Sure. I mean, um, if you'd like, I can share a presentation. I have some pictures um, that might give an impression. Yeah, fabulous. So, okay. I'm going to start with this one. I was pictured just quickly to show you. I mean, this is a size comparison between Germany, in this case, and Lebanon. And you see how tiny Lebanon is. Um, I mean, compared to some states in the US, even Germany is tiny. So uh, mm -hmm. Lebanon is really it's it's so small <laughs> and, um, and uh, if you zoom in you see Beirut at the capital of course you see Israel in the south and you see Syria surrounding uh, Lebanon and um, since the beginning of the civil war in Syria um, you have they have been about two million refugees from Syria going to Lebanon and if you consider mm -hmm. that Lebanon has only five million inhabitants roughly maybe six yeah. million uh, it's about a third of the population wow uh, you know uh, so this is it's really incredible in Germany we would have to take in 25 to 30 million people <laughs> <laughs> to achieve that so uh, it's really it's the country now in the world with the highest rate um, of refugees you know, per person, per 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 uh, yeah, per inhabitant. Yeah, yeah. And I just I, I prepared some pictures that I took uh, and when I was there last time, um, would show you some some time uh, some yeah some pictures that might you know surprise you because you you might not expect them um, when talking about an Arab country. So this uh, the picture in the left, it's. The beach I spent some time in my childhood with. Uh, it's near the house of my aunt, and in the right picture on top is me standing on on the top of the house, you know, looking at the beach. And uh, the left picture on the down uh, downside it's the Corniche in Beirut. You can walk there for many kilometers, and on the right side you see um, people. You know, this is where the youth um, swims. So it's it has no sandy beach, uh, but. It's rather rocky, but um, you still have possibilities to, to rent jet ski, for example. And it's, <laughs> um, yeah, really. And uh, there's also a lot of, of, you know, cultural heritage. For example, the picture on the right, this is Byblos, which is said to be the oldest, um, or the, 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 the oldest city in the world that has been inhabited for you know, the for a constant time. So mm. um, it was founded by the Phoenicians uh, 4,000 before Christ. And since then has constantly been inhabited. So um, there's a lot of, of, of interesting, if you're interested in, in history or um, archeology, span you'll find many, many interesting things in, in Lebanon. I just cut things short here and jump to, to nature, you know, so you so, if you look at the picture from the right, this could also be in New Zealand, for example. So people are surprised uh, to see that this exists in, in Lebanon. Uh, these are famous waterfalls and there's also great, uh, the mountains are great to hike, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you um, look at Beirut from the ocean, as you see in this picture in, in the front, wow. this is the harbor before, before the explosion that uh -huh. happened in 2020. Then you see Beirut and you see the mountains and these mountains are also the border to Syria. So behind these mountains, there's Syria. So if you look at this picture, this is really the whole country. It's not, it, this is it. So yeah. you know, it, it starts at the beach and it goes to the mountain and this is it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it goes a little bit to the left and to, to the right, but basically that's Lebanon. And, um, 
and talking about research, I mean, you, if you go to Lebanon through, through Beirut, you see, you still the, see these houses, you know, with bullet holes. You mm -hmm. see uh, some sites that Beirut was divided during the civil war. Um, this is how Beirut looked after the war. Immediately mm -hmm. after the war in 1990, you see that nature, you know, came back uh, to those sites where people didn't go to anymore. Yeah. It really looked like, I mean, this is a, uh, used to be a famous street in Beirut. So um, you really can could just like imagine Fifth Avenue in New York, you know, nobody going there for, for 15 years of war. Maybe this is how Fifth Avenue would look like, you know, 15 years <laughs> later. It's, it's really crazy. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the capital in the world. It, it used to be, as I described it in the beginning, uh, yeah, multicultural city uh, um, that was famous. And, and this is how it, what the war made it look like. And I'm also showing these pictures because this is, you know, the city where the novel is set in. It's, it's a, a 19, 1994 uh, when Amin strolls through the city and this is the city he discovers. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm gonna just gonna skip this and, and uh, talk about the missing for just for a second. Um, you know, 17,000 disappeared. You see here the relatives um, asking for, asking the government, you know, to support their search, which um, it's, um, they don't get any answers, of course, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just some more pictures of those. This looks, in these pictures, it looks like a movement, but make no mistake, it's really small. It's just these women, um, they are, very old now yeah sometimes they have been looking for their loved ones for 40 years or more i talked to those women you know and they said life for 40 years has been like whenever someone knocks at the door you go and you open that door thinking now yeah you know and, mm -hmm. and that for 40 years every day because people knock on doors often in Lebanon <laughs> because neighbors <laughs> neighbors come in all the time and these are some pictures um some pictures I took in the in the archive and you see it's very chaotic you know it's it's uh, it's not like a museum or something you really have to look for <laughs> for things and <clears throat> what you see here is newspapers and uh, from the time of the war and if you read those newspapers you really see you know these small texts every day in the newspapers where someone is looking for a, a loved one that has not come home so mm -hmm. yeah and i have these just a few more um you see here uh, how old were they when they disappeared most of them uh, age at the time of disappearance and you see most of them were very young between 15 and 19. yeah um this is because most young men in this age joined the militia mm -hmm. you know, to fight and they probably disappeared uh, while fighting and you also see that in 1982, most people disappeared because it was a very violent year of the war. This is also the year when my parents left Lebanon because of the war, because it got too violent. And, um, and also this is interesting, maybe as the last one, you see which action is preferred by the families. And you see that only little one, 3%, they hope for punishment, mm -hmm. you know, or compensation, most of them, want to know the fate of the missing persons or they want searching procedures to get him back. They really just want to know what happened. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, so maybe we stop here just uh, with the pictures, but um, all of this, this not talking about the past, the silence that I have read for, about in the prologue, this has led to yeah, a society that is deeply divided. Um, by you know also by the stories they have been told about the past and also because these stories are stories about the others you know mm -hmm. uh, from the war uh, um, every religion and we're, we're talking about 18 different religious groups in Lebanon wow yeah it, it's it's also something that is unique to Lebanon uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you have 18 equally uh, um, yeah, uh, equal. Uh, there's no state religion, but all religions, 18 uh, religions are, are equal, uh, equally considered. So, um, um, and of course, depending of what community you grow 
you grow up in, the stories you are being told about the past, they differ from what you, your friend with a different religion is being told about the past. So, mm -hmm. um, and also about the, the, the government, you know, there was an amnesia after the war, which said that the crimes committed in war, they will not be um, prosecuted. So it allowed militia, former militiamen to join the government and that it has not changed until today. Um, so there is no talking about the past and there's a lot of corruption and it has really led to a state of misery where people are now, you know, facing hunger, uh, unemployment, uh, inflation with more than 100%. Uh, uh, it's, it's um, yeah, things have gone out of hand, you can say. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for, for painting that picture for us. Sure. That really, that really, yeah, it really says a lot. Um, with the silence that you're talking about, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to talk a little bit about how you developed your characters. As we, as we said, our, our narrator, Amin, was brought to Germany. He was brought out of the country in 1982 by his grandmother. His parents died in a car accident and in the early, in 1994, his grandmother decides it's now time to return to Lebanon. And we see, we see the young Amin, 14 years old, I believe he is at that time, 13 or 14. And we see him adjusting to this, to life in this country, whose language he speaks, whose culture he's familiar with from his grandmother and some of the other exiled Lebanese people living outside of Munich. Um, but it really is, it is a new, it is a new place for him. And he befriends an, another young boy in his class, class called Jafar, who has lived through all of this. He has spent his entire childhood in this city. He has experienced the trauma of a childhood spent in wartime. And with, with all of this, um, and thinking about how you, develop some of these characters and some of the storylines between them. Um, I'm, I'm curious about a few things about how some of the characters emerged, but one of the points that I wanted to make because you were just speaking about the silence and this kind of collective or rather enforced amnesia within the government that then seeps into the country and every group will treat it differently. There are many secrets in this novel kept between characters. And I wonder for you as the writer, if any of your characters kept secrets from you, if there were aspects of their stories where you even thought, I don't know, they're not going to reveal this to me. Um, actually, yes. I mean, <clears throat> we have Amin as um, the narrator of the book. He's, he's speaking, as you said, from, from the future, so from 2011, uh, mm -hmm. when the Arab Spring emerges and the revolutions they, in the different countries, they come closer to Lebanon and he remembers his childhood. And, and um, this is where the point from where he speaks, but he also speaks from a point where, you know, he, you, he knows everything. So, uh, so now he is telling us his story by, you know, and telling uh, and keeping secrets from us. And he's deciding when he gives us which information uh, um, so when we follow his story, but he also admits uh, um, that um, there has been so many, there, there are so many dark spots that he, as the storyteller of this novel, has to be just that, a storyteller. He, the, he has to tell us a story that could be the truth. It, it, uh, uh, it could be just the, the truth, but it could just be part of the truth or... <laughs> A story so and um to be honest i i really much enjoyed uh, um writing the book like this uh, because um i mean it felt realistic it really felt because even if you do research for, for many years uh, you will still you, you can talk to one person talking about an event and you talk to another person about the same event and you will get a whole different story Mm -hmm. It's impossible to say which one is true, and we shall not forget that um, 
history is just that a story the history uh, we uh, speak about in germany um you know uh, about the if we talk about the second world war we have done a lot to um to be as clear as possible about that past but uh, i mean there it's it's a uh, it's a story we agree on let's just say that it's a history we it's a story our history is a story most people agree on mm -hmm. but what happens in a country where you have a history where people can't agree on you just have many parallel existing stories and all these stories are equally important and equally right in their own case and and they are they they're just like a mosaic or and this mosaic is the history of that country um, so um, when Amin writes this story he realizes that especially when it comes to Jaffa his childhood friend uh, um, um, there are many things that um, years later he realizes that might have been different than he thought but he can't know for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of the <clears throat> one of the one of the things I think is done is done very well in in this in this book and the way Amin is presenting his story and essentially reconstructing the past is that he's using he's relying quite heavily on notebooks that he kept as a boy and yeah. I think that it's an easy tendency for us to have to say oh well I'm keeping a diary or I've kept a journal, I've kept a notebook. So 20 years from now, I can look back. And of course, I'll remember. I'll remember what I was like at age 14. And on the one hand, he does, he does use these notebooks essentially as, as evidence or to, to search for clues. But he himself says, there are some entries that I don't recognize myself in. I can't believe that I could possibly have read have have written them mm. and and i think it's an interesting it's an interesting form of research personal research um, and and if we draw a parallel between personal journal journaling and creating a personal narrative and a nation's um even if there's no national archive unfortunately but there is still there is still evidence there are archives that include newspaper clippings from the time of the Civil War and evidence of people having gone missing, that even with what we might consider cold hard evidence and, and, and facts, it falls apart in your hands at times. It, it isn't necessarily as reliable or, or as, as seamless as we might want it to be. Exactly, that's, that's what I wanted to show. I mean, even if you, uh, when we finish our conversation and you and, and you decide to you know write uh, in your diary a summary of what we or, or whatever uh, just how you remember it you're already deciding to to take a, a, a such a, you choose a side from which you you decide to remember this conversation and you already you know just leaving out many things necessarily and and uh, and some you are inventing at the same you're you're trying to document but you're inventing at the same time and this mm -hmm. uh, so it's impossible to be to create something that is 100 percent reliable yeah even even in, in photographs which play a role in the book also it, you decide you know which angle you take a picture from and which angle uh, uh, and, and uh, if you if you blur out the background or uh, you decide to show everything these are you know um decisions you make and by making these decisions you're already you, you're changing reality somehow you know right. and you're, you're just showing an, a, a frame uh, and there there's many things outside the frame that you can't show this is somehow similar that's right that's right and 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 i imagine i imagine for you as an author this must also resonate um i think that it's it's another tendency some of us may have to think that we can look at a work of art and and find some truth about the creator. And certainly at one point in this novel, Amin is looking for clues about his childhood friend Jafar and is looking at pictures he's taken and is just, is, is trying to read into the decisions that were made. And it's anyone's guess why those decisions were made. And they may have been purely aesthetic. They may have been a mistake, 
there's there's no way of telling yeah yeah so um it's uh it's kind of a metaphor for you know the whole country <laughs> yeah yeah i would i would also like to I, I had mentioned, uh, you know, curious about about some of the characters. We've spoken a little bit about Jafar. I don't want to give away too much. I'm I'm quite curious about the development of Yara, who is Amin's grandmother, and how she came to you as a character. Yeah, she was maybe the most difficult um, character to write about because um, she's a. I mean the. The relationship between them, between her and Amin, is maybe you can, you know, it's characterized by the absence of words. Of of they they are they are both unable to. They are they feel and and they, that they are there are many things that they don't talk about, but they are unable to find words, uh, um, you know, to get closer to each other. And um, Yara, she. At some point of the story, she decides to tell a lie uh, to Amin, um, and this lie changes everything because uh, it, it's somehow it 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 uh, turns out to be the foundation where many other lies, you know, are being built onto. Um, but it was very important to me to show that she's not a liar, you know, she's not evil, yeah. she's not she's not, uh, uh, but she's doing it to protect him in a way. Um, uh, not from from you know bad events uh, from to happen, but rather from she wants to prevent him uh, from becoming her, <laughs> you know, or uh, uh -huh. uh, and that's why he tells tells she, she tells the, the lie. But uh, this is exactly why he starts resembling her more and more because um, you know this lie uh, it sets the story uh, in motion somehow. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, and um, but this was important. I didn't want to to be to to portray her as um, you know someone who's just um, telling lies, uh, uh, but as someone who's who's um, who are she's aware of her absence of of uh, her inability to communicate and and telling a lie to protect him is her way, uh, mm -hmm. a way she can yeah she can rely on and and. Uh, Years later, of course, it's it's uh, she she regrets it, and um, but uh, yeah. So this was difficult, and also, um, you know, she somehow also is like a metaphor for um, many people in Lebanon fighting amnesia, but not knowing really how to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I, I I wonder if I can actually jump on to this this point about Yara and um and and let let our viewers know uh a little bit about um one of the a, a big a big thing in the translation a big a big point in the translation that was um that was both that was both difficult for me as the translator and um and worth worth discussing a little bit I think and and it actually comes from it comes from the section you read in the prologue about silence and the silence that you're that you're speaking about about Yara's silence toward Amin not telling things not revealing things holding her tongue and in German the word for this type of silence silence is Schweigen which means to not speak mm -hmm. and it's kind of it's kind of surprising because this is actually an active verb. It is the act of being inactive, essentially. It is the act of not speaking. And often, when this word comes up in in a German text, it's usually the the action ascribed to a person. She, Schweigen. She did not speak, or she didn't respond. She didn't say anything. Uh, she kept quiet. These are often kind of the the short phrases that, as a German to English translator, we have to use to convey the meaning of this word. And in in the section you read about silence, 
um, which is a hugely important word in this book. I mean, the book talks about the silence of a nation and truly it's the silence of people not speaking to each other about this perhaps unspeakable past. And what happens when we aren't able to speak about and to process and to get answers for the questions that we have. And in, in that section that you read, Schweigen, this not speaking, is set up in opposition to the word Stille, which I translated as stillness, which I think, I mean, in, in addition to it being the same root, it's, it's essentially the same word in English and German, um, but Stille in German could also be translated as silence, yeah. which is different from this not speaking kind of silence. Um, and so, but, but in, in, this, in this passage where you're talking about Schweigen, I, I felt I had to use the word silence because that is also something between people that is, that is it's, it's palpable to think about the silence that emerges. But unfortunately, this is one, it's, it's sort of a shade of nuance where in the translation, when you're reading this prologue and you come up against silence, it isn't immediately clear that what we're talking about is the kind of silence between individuals. And it, it becomes clear over the course of the novel that of course this is, this is what we're talking about, this, this not talking, this active inactivity, if, if, if I may. Um, you know, and then, and, and, and in this section discussing stillness as, you know, I'm sitting in my apartment here and, and we're, we're sort of familiar now with the, the Zoom format where earlier when you were talking, I muted, I muted myself because I was aware there might be a, a siren in the background from the street or the ticking of a clock, the hum of the refrigerator um, that I felt stillness could could contain. Um, and then, and then in, in that same paragraph, we have another two synonyms for silence or quiet, uh, Ruhe and Lautlosigkeit, which I then translated as quiet or hush. And so I, I wanted to draw people's attention to, I mean, really these different levels of shading, essentially of the same word, but then also the fact that German does have a word that English does not have, that has yet another kind of level of meaning and, and complexity that in translation is, is not quite possible to convey with, with utter precision. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, the fate of every destination uh, of every of every translation that you know at some point it it loses something but it, there are many points where it gains uh, the text gains something i mean mm -hmm. there um, there is later in the in the book when amin remembers his grandmother for the first time you know talking about her appearance also what did she look like and was what was she like and she, he remembers her the first thing he remembers is her language, you know, uh, the words, the words uh, she used to bring from the German to the Arabic when they moved there and she was, you know, interweaving them in her Arabic language, still using them. So this is what, what maybe shows it best that, you know, that we are talking about the silence of, of people because now where she's gone, he realized that language was what, you know, should have connected them, but wasn't. And, and this is why he, you know, tries to get closer to her first by remembering her language and then her appearance mm -hmm. and everything. And I think, um, um, yeah, the way you translated is very nice because you you kept the German words, but you added the, the English words. You could have just, you know, left the Germans, German words out, for example, but uh, you, you have them side by side, which is nice. And yeah. there, there's also, also some, I mean, some parts of the book are funny <laughs> uh, <laughs> beside the, the topic as being so 
so heavy um, and there's one um, one list uh, Amin makes about Jafar, you know, making fun of, of his uh, Jafar is missing an eye actually, which which is not funny, but, yeah, just... but they they both being you know being teenagers, sometimes they make fun of it, uh, and there's a list of, and in German this list uh, is, is it contains many different you know, word plays with with the word seeing, uh, and while writing it, I. Some, something that, that didn't happen when I wrote the first book because I didn't even expect the book to be translated. But when I wrote the second book, there were some uh, um, phrases while writing, I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting for, <laughs> for, for the translator. So I was very curious how, how you would uh, translate this list. And this is also a very good example of, you know, your, your own sense of humor, maybe that you, and your own creativity, because you had to be creative in, in inventing uh, uh, word plays uh, that don't change the meaning of the list entirely, but some, but st still contains the humor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was, and, and that list was so much fun. <laughs> it was so much fun to translate. And, you know, I would, I would have one of the phrases, one of the bullet points from this list in my mind, just kind of turning it over, like, how am I going to do that? And then it would, then it would come to me. And it was, it was, I, I looked at it the other day and, and it was, it was fun to see that I think that I actually, I actually inserted some extra jokes mm -hmm. instead of just, because I also love working with language and words. I of course love word games and, and puns. And so I had a really fun time. I had, I had a really fun time with that and using idioms that include the word I, but then also incorporating some some particular verbs like blindsided and uh, um, keeping an eye on the prize was one of the was one of the phrases. Um, so it was really it was really uh, th that was that was really a lot of fun. To, glad, yeah. And, yeah, and also and Good. also to channel some adolescent humor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found I was also born in 1985, and it was I felt fairly helpful for me, although certainly not having a comparable experience to these boys as 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 young teenagers in in Lebanon um for me just rem remembering some of the some of the slang terms or some of the ways we would express ourselves uh at that time it was helpful to have to have some personal <laughs> personal connection to that time that's great so yeah, yeah should yeah. <laughs> our viewers decide to read the book they will they will not um and that's your translation is excellent so you're you're not going to miss anything if you read the english translation it's not yeah. that you're using something thanks thanks <laughs> yeah and so i'm i'm so i'm so thankful to you pierre for for taking the time today to have this conversation with me and um thankful to tracy and everyone at the tennessee williams festival um and uh and to our publisher, World Editions, for for arranging this, uh, it's been it's been a real delight to speak with you, Pierre. And I encourage everyone. Thank you, audience, for tuning into this Zoom presentation. And hopefully, we can all meet in person in the near future. Um, you have Pierre. You have the <laughs> yes. I, I, okay. It's going to be cover. out in April. My light is. Uh, it's going to be out in April, I think. Yes, a couple of weeks from that's right. today we're recording this. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Okay.